great to be here. Um, I actually want to start by, even though we're in a football stadium, I want to start by uh, talking about a baseball player. Um, Babe Ruth, in 1914, started his career with the Boston Red Sox. And uh, everybody, of course, knows who Babe Ruth is. What a lot of people may not know is that Babe Ruth was probably the best pitcher in baseball when he started his career. And so there's two times in his career he won 23 games, uh, leading the league in wins. And so from 1914 through the end of the 1918 season, he was the most dominant baseball player as a pitcher. The problem with being a pitcher is that he only played one out of every five days. And because he, he thought he was the best baseball player on the planet and he wanted to play more. So after the 1918 season, he convinced his manager at the Red Sox to put him in left field so that he could play every day. And while well, the manager was reluctant to do that, you take you know, the best pitcher in the game and then you're gonna say you're not gonna pitch anymore, puts him in left field. That first season in 1919, Babe Ruth, of course, leads the league in home runs and you know, starts his career as probably the greatest home run hitter ever to play the game. What's fascinating about his career, though, is what happened after the 1919 season is that up until this time, when you, when you were a ball player for a club, and that's what they were called then, they were clubs, they weren't these big sports franchises, but you were kind of their property and nobody messed with you. Teams didn't compete for the services of other teams' players. There was no such thing as free agency. So if you signed with the Red Sox, you're gonna play your whole career with the Red Sox until you retired, got hurt, or whatever happened. And uh, now if you got fired, you had an opportunity to get hired by another team, but there weren't trades, there weren't free agencies where people could swap from one team to another. At the end of the 1919 season, in what probably is still today considered to be the worst transaction of any professional sports franchise, the Red Sox did not trade Babe Ruth to the Yankees, they sold him. And so for a nominal amount of money, they sold the rights to Babe Ruth to the Yankees, and, and obviously it set the Yankees on a path that uh, it's the reason why most of us in the room hate them, right? You either, either love the Yankees or you hate the Yankees. There's very few in-betweens. And so, but what was interesting, so when Babe Ruth was sold right before the 1920 season, it really represented a shift not only in baseball, but in all of professional sports. It was really the, the advent of, or the advent of free agency. Where, where players would be able to represent themselves and negotiate with different teams, where teams would be able to go after players and begin trading for players. And it really, it, it marked a significant shift in the way that professional franchises, professional sports franchises were run from a business standpoint. I would argue that we are in the same type of shift that happened when Babe Ruth went from the Red Sox to the Yankees. We're in the same type of shift that's getting ready, that we're in the midst of happening today in the investment management realm. That there is a massive change that's going to take place that has already begun. Some of you in your portfolios, you've recognized what that change is. And, and it really deals with an area that I think is very appropriate for a tax lien talk because it's fixed income. For more than 30 years, we've had yields falling in the treasury market and in the bond market. And so as yields have fallen, what that's done is it's pushed prices higher and it's provided bonds or the fixed income markets have provided a great non-correlation or diversification to the volatility that you normally get when you invest in a stock. So people expect higher returns when they invest in the stock market and they know that they're accepting a higher level of risk as a result of that. And so as you get closer and closer to retirement or as your need for ongoing income goes up, most people know it's risky to need income from an equity portfolio because you don't want to take money out if the market drops 20%. Now, if you've got a long enough time horizon, the market can drop 20, 30, 40, it dropped over 45% between September of 2008 and March of 2009, and yet five years later, it was back at an all-time high. Now, if you were having to take money out of that portfolio when it was down 40%, then you would still be a long way of trying to get back to where you were then. So people have historically used bonds or fixed income, whether it's individual bonds, municipal bonds, ETFs, mutual funds, whatever. They've used bonds as a hedge for portfolio risk. And that's worked wonderful for the 30 years that yields have been declining. 
But now we're entering into a period that I would suggest will last somewhere between 10 and 20 years of what I would say yields are having to normalize. The Federal Reserve has kept yields artificially so low for so long that, that as the rates start to normalize, the amount of volatility that we're going to see in the bond market is very likely to be greater than the volatility in the stock market. And, and it's something that very, very few investors are prepared for what's going to happen. We publish research every month, and, and in our last month's research, it says, what happened to safe is, is the title of the research, because the normal, the, the part that most investors have viewed as being the safe part of their portfolio lost 3.5% in one month. And it's just because interest rates just started the process of going back to, to what we would call normalized levels. In fact, if you look at something like the 10-year U.S. Treasury, okay, the way that that's usually priced is GDP growth plus inflation expectations. That's normally the yield on a 10-year Treasury. Today, we've got a 10-year Treasury that's yielding about 2.4%. Um, the, the consensus blue chip economists believe that over the next four quarters, we'll see 2.5 to 2.6% GDP growth and 1.6% inflation. Okay, the Fed is actively trying to get inflation to 2%. So that means from a quote unquote normal standpoint, the 10 year bond, which trades at 2.4 today, probably needs to go up to about 4 to 4.2%. When that happens, you're going to see somewhere between a 20 and a 28% drop in the underlying value of a bond. So imagine somebody that's got $100,000 in bonds that six months out only has $80,000 on their statement. Now, if you hold them to maturity, you will get your money back as long as the bond doesn't default. But people like getting those statements every month that don't show massive drops. And, and so we're at this period where from an investment standpoint, especially for investors that need income, it's going to be a very, very, very difficult environment for them. For those that are using multiple kind of diversified portfolios, thinking that it's going to reduce risk, it's not going to do that. The traditional investments are not going to reduce risk like what they've done in the past. So what do you do? Well, at Peak Capital, one of the things that we did was developed a strategic relationship with Atrium to launch a private equity fund that invests solely in real estate tax liens. Why do we do that? Well, a couple of reasons. One is that uh, as a portfolio manager, whether I'm owning a portfolio of individual stocks, whether I'm managing a group of ETFs that provide ongoing income, whatever it is, you're always looking for ways to invest a portfolio with non-correlation. You know, there's a mistake that a lot of investors make, and they think that if they're diversified, right? We grow up listening to the phrase, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And so we think that if in a portfolio we own this fund and this fund and this stock and this fund and this ETF, we can look at it and have 12, 15, 18, 20 different holdings inside of our portfolio. And we kind of pat ourselves on the back and we think, well, we don't, we're not putting all of our eggs in one basket. Or we allocate some with this advisor and some with this fund company. And, you know, we think we've diversified. The problem, though, is that if, there's the, if the correlation of those different investments are high, you're not getting any benefit of diversification whatsoever. I've literally seen portfolios that have 15 to 20 holdings in them, and the correlation of all of them is over 90%. That was what was shocking to people about 2008 and 2009. It wasn't just the fact that the markets dropped so steeply in that correction in the financial crisis, it's that the correlation of assets that previously had low correlations to one another became almost one. And so international equities, which normally only had a correlation of about 0.4 to U.S. stocks, went to a correlation of 0.96. There was a 96% chance if the stocks in the U.S. dropped, stocks overseas were dropping at the same time. Value versus growth. Okay? Those correlations used to be in the 70s. Okay? So you got some benefit of non-correlation by owning growth stocks versus value stocks. Correlation went to 97.4.
small cap, mid cap, large cap, no matter what asset class you looked at. If you bought high yield bonds, the, the correlation between the high yield bond index and the S&P 500 was 96. So all of these assets went to a correlation, meaning that everything was falling at the same time. If you're fortunate to hold a little bit of gold, it was in fact the best performing asset class during the financial crisis. And so, but gold has been a horrible investment essentially ever since. So the issue isn't to just diversify by having a whole bunch of different holdings. It's to actually find something that's non-correlated to the other assets that you're trying to reduce the risk of. So I can show you that if you have three assets inside of a portfolio and those three assets are non-correlated, the level of diversification that you're going to get, the ability to reduce portfolio volatility is much greater than holding 25 assets that all tend to be highly correlated. And that's why we're so positive about the tax lien industry, is that tax liens are almost perfectly non-correlated to any other type of investment vehicle. They're non-correlated to U.S. Treasuries. They're non-correlated to high-yield bonds. They're non-correlated to domestic or global stocks. And the fact that they're non-correlated to those things, and I would add that they are non-correlated to Federal Reserve policy. Federal Reserve policy, if you look at the mess that's going on in, in uh, Europe right now and, and what's happening with Greece, there is no solution. You know, they're trying to come up with a solution for something that there is no solution for. And uh, so they could keep kicking the can down the road. They almost didn't this time, but now it appears that they're going to. But it'll just be a very short period of time before they default again, before the people in Greece throw out the current government, bring someone else in that won't force the type of austerity that, that is going to be forced upon the Greece people. So it is a merry-go-round, and, and there's just no way for them to get off it. They will, Greece will default. They will leave the euro. Um, no ifs, ands, or buts. I mean, it's, it's just a matter of when it happens and how much pain that inflicts. So central bank policy is what I would argue is one of the greatest threats to you as an investor. That, that the central banks, in a collaborative way, have engaged in this grand experiment that's never been done before. They said, you know, what if we just started printing money? What if we just print money and print money and print money to try to create economic growth? And so the Fed's done that and grown their balance sheet from around $4 trillion to $15 trillion. And, and so you've seen this exponential growth and yet we have fewer people. So they've spent trillions of dollars stimulating the economy so that the economy would grow. And we have fewer people working today than we did in 2007. Fewer people. So the economy has grown as measured by GDP. But in terms of the things that you would look at to say, is, a, is an economy healthy? It's not. And so we've thrown a massive amount of money at something that hasn't worked. And the truth is, the Bank of uh, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, the People's Bank of China, the ECB and the Fed, none of them have any idea how to reverse the policy as it is right now or what impact that's going to have. And so regardless, as an investor, regardless of where you're investing, the likelihood that central bank policy errors add a tremendous amount of volatility and risk to your portfolio, I think is unmistakable. And so when you look at tax liens, you've actually got an investment that I would say is completely non-correlated to Federal Reserve policy. It does not matter what Janet Yellen and the people on the Fed Board of Governors, it does not matter what they do in terms of impacting the underlying value of a tax lien. If the tax lien is purchased properly, you know, using the due diligence that obviously you should be using if you're buying tax liens, that that because you know you're essentially in a first position lending it at such a small percentage of the underlying value of the asset that it really doesn't matter the fed policy could cause the biggest recession that we've had since 1929 and i believe that tax liens will still be a solid investment and you're not going to be able to say that about a lot of other things so why did we do what we did? We did it because, one, we believe that the aging of population, that there's going to be more demand for yield. There's going to be more investors who need income from their portfolios. As people get closer and closer to retirement, 
the first thing is going to be where is income going to come from? And with a massive amount of volatility in the stock and bond markets, it's going to be very difficult to take income from a traditional portfolio. Second reason we did this is because, let's face it, tax liens are a tough place to invest in. They're a tough place to invest in. It's very difficult for individuals to go out and acquire and manage tax liens. There's oftentimes no liquidity within tax liens. So we've created a fund with professional management. We use Opus Fund Services out of Chicago as an administrator. Um, Spicer Jeffries is our uh, national, what is it, uh, public company oversight accounting board, our PCOAB auditor. And so we've got professional auditors, professional administrators. Uh, Sattis and Goldberg is our counsel out of Manhattan. And so they've designed a fund that allows us to do some things. One is to create reliable pricing. Because oftentimes it's very difficult to come, as an investor to come about and find out what is accurate pricing on these tax liens. Uh, second is the liquidity issue. Is that I know when you buy a tax lien, it's your intention to probably hold that until the tax lien is either paid off or you foreclose on the property. But sometimes life happens. Sometimes investors who want to access tax liens don't necessarily have the time frame or, or their circumstances change and that they would like to have the ability to create liquidity on a tax lien instrument where today it's very difficult to do. So we created a fund that would have a short 18 month lockup period and the ability to provide liquidity so that investors could come in and out of a tax lien investment, very similar to how you could go in and out of the S&P 500. And so, and then the third thing would just be professional management. It would be, uh, I am glad that my office, that Jeff and I are not responsible for looking at all the analytics. That's why we work with Atria. Uh, we, we believe that you know, they're a, a best in class in terms of their ability to manage, to custody, to acquire the tax liens, to do the due diligence on which states to be participating in. We have conversations about what that is, but it's certainly not. My, my area of expertise is in managing investment portfolios, not in acquiring and custodying tax liens. And I think that uh, what we've been able to do together offers the industry, offers investors an opportunity to participate in an asset class that's been difficult, provide that liquidity and pricing, and uh, we hope it fills a niche. We hope it fills a need. Happy to answer any questions about the fund or Greece's exit from the euro or uh, how many home runs Babe Ruth hit. Yes. Correct. And then after that, they can come in and, and leave whenever they want. Correct. As you know, when we acquire those liens, we don't know what that redemptive curve is going to be right away. And so we're going to take the capital. We're going to go buy liens with that capital. And we know that from an 18-month standpoint that we'll get enough turnover in that that we'll have the ability to take dollars in and allow dollars to leave. Yes, sir. You said your pricing um, changes over time, or is it at par the entire time? But after 18 months, does, is it at what I bought it for, or do you have a, a daily price mechanism? Daily price mechanism that would be, be based on accrued earnings of it, um, signed off by both the administrator and the auditor. Another thing we're able to resolve that, that was a challenge, um, and some of you investors you know, certainly some of the industry people would be aware of that, is, you know, the, the way to generate, especially as pressure has been on yields in the tax lien industry, right, as, as it's become more and more competitive trying to buy tax liens, it's driven the yields down, which really increases the need of using some level of leverage on that in order to generate returns. Because it's, let's face it, it's expensive to do the due diligence to go participate in auctions you know, to, to do, you know, six, eight auctions a month and to do the due diligence on that, you're going to spend quite a bit of money acquiring a pool of tax liens. And so we want to be able to use leverage to get the overall yield on the portfolio up to a level that's going to be attractive, say 8% net of all fees paid quarterly to investors. So that's, you know, that's what we're targeting is an 8% net of fees paid out quarterly to the investors. So in order to get that, you can't go buy tax liens that are yielding 9% pay the cost of doing the due diligence 
pay the cost of acquisition, pay the cost of custody, pay for the auditors, administrators, and counsel that give you the security of literally having it be a secured fund versus an unsecured investment with a company. So without using leverage, you're just not going to be able to get there. And we figured uh, out how to take in, you know, the idea with leverage means that if you have IRA money, you can't invest your IRA in something that utilizes leverage. Uh, the IRS does not allow that. If you've done that, my suggestion would be get out of that investment as quickly as possible. That the IRS finds out that your IRA is invested in something that uses leverage, that creates something called unrelated business taxable income and it'll disqualify your IRA. So we got a workaround for that. So within the one fund, you can come in in an equity position, which uh, does not restrict you in any way uh, as far as the UBTI, but you can't use an IRA to do it. So you couldn't use an IRA, a charitable trust, a pension plan. You can't use anything that is tax qualified money on the equity side. But then within the fund, we also have internally a debt offering that, that you can invest in. And so that way, the debt that's issued against the fund, and really it's, it's a dollar for dollar collateral just like it is on the equity standpoint, but if it's treated as debt, then there is no leverage. So you're not participating as an equity uh, partner in a fund that has leverage. You're actually owning debt issued by the fund, so then you don't, worry, you don't have to worry about the UBTI issue. So the fund is set up so that uh, you can invest both qualified and non-qualified dollars. Yes? On a monthly basis, yeah. As required by the uh, auditors and administrators. Any other questions? If not, great to be here with you. Uh, Jeff and I will be hanging out. If there's any uh, questions that we can answer for you or help in any way, just let us know. Thank you.